Good morning, church. Been a great weekend around here, great Lord's Day. Been wonderful to meet uh, new friends, Luke and Sarah. And if you haven't met Jasper, he's the star of the three, little Jasper. But uh, last evening we gathered with a bunch of our young people and their parents. There was about 40 or 50 people who played together a little while. Preacher count that 75. But uh, we're excited to meet them and, and about the possibilities. We're glad you're here today to devote this time to the Lord. I want you to think about the question, how precious is the gift of sight. Our oldest daughter was born in April of 1994. You can do the math on how old she is. But when she was born, I remember it very clearly, we did what I suppose all parents do when they first see their child. We counted her fingers and toes, and we looked her all over, and and saw that she looked hale and hearty, for which we were very thankful, of course. Sometime during those first hours with baby Madeline, see, when she's not here, I get to talk about her. Um, they're out of town this weekend. But sometime in those first hours, when we got to see her with her eyes open a little bit more consistently, we noticed a spot or a discoloration on one of her eyes. And of course we were concerned when we saw that and her doctors and nurses um, looked at it closely and, and in the hospital there assured us that it, it didn't appear to be in her line of vision. But of course they scheduled an appointment with uh, an eye specialist as soon as it could be arranged. And I'll never forget that appointment uh, with with our newborn. It was sort of a large practice, a vision practice, a specialist kind of doctors. And there were several different doctors that worked there. And, and the doctor who uh, our baby was assigned to, when he saw her, um, saw what was on her eye, he immediately called the other doctors in the practice in so they could see it. Now, when a doctor is checking you out, you never want him or her on the phone calling their associates saying, come in here, you gotta see this. That's a little bit nerve wracking, as you can understand, but that's sort of what happened. And, and Madeline <clears throat> just was a few days old and uh, they've got one of her eyes clamped open. She's on the exam table and she's surrounded by the four doctors and then some associates and, and, and nurses. And uh, they're all checking out this little, what turned out to be a sclera cornea on her eye. And, and apparently it was a pretty rare thing, at least at that time. And most of them hadn't s had a lot of experience seeing it. And she was squalling, as you can imagine. Good news was that, that the exam confirmed that it didn't affect her vision and probably wouldn't. Um, and we all breathed a sigh of relief because we all appreciate how precious eyesight is. You know, there's a thread that runs throughout Scripture about sight. And it's really prominent in the ministry of our Lord. You know, Jesus often restores sight miraculously. And, and then at times he laments the fact that so many people who have perfectly functioning eyes physically are more blind than those whose physical eyes have never worked. In fact, on that great day, it's recorded back in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus visited his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, and he did the scripture reading that day in the synagogue, and, and he read from a particular chapter, which we know is Isaiah chapter 61. And one of the things there in that reading, 
he said that he was going to fulfill from the prophecy of Isaiah, and it was the recovering of sight to the blind. In fact, he stood up and said, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Then later on, when his cousin John was in prison and in a very difficult situation, John is sending a message to Jesus asking for evidence that Jesus is really the one that's been sent from God. This is in Luke chapter 7. Jesus in response says, go tell John, What you have seen and heard, the blind receive their sight. And so Jesus often had compassion upon those who could not see, but he was also often frustrated by those who, though their eyes worked perfectly well, were nonetheless blind to the most important truths of life. This morning... We come to the close of Luke chapter 18. Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem is almost over. He's in Jericho. It's really the last stop if you're traveling to Jerusalem. And it's just about 15 miles away from Jerusalem through the desert hills and about a day's walk. Jericho is a beautiful place, beautiful oasis city in the desert. Um, Many people called it the city of palm trees. It's sort of a resort town. The king, King Herod, had palaces there and resort spots. But there was a man there uh, who couldn't enjoy any of the beauties of that town because he was blind. His name was Bartimaeus. Other gospel writers give the name. Luke does not. Uh, But he was doing what most all people in the ancient world with his condition did. He was begging. Begging for help. Begging for alms. That was really his only means of survival. I just want us to hear what happened on this particular day in Luke 18. Begin reading in verse 35. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. I want you to remember what's just happened previous person that Jesus had encountered on the road to Jerusalem was a rich young ruler who refused to follow Jesus because it meant giving up his extreme wealth. When Jesus said on that occasion how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, his disciples, you remember, had responded, then who can be saved? Because they thought, surely all rich people were saved. And Jesus said, no, it's hard for them. And so they say, who can be saved? Well, we're about to find out. Example number one, answer number one to that question, who can be saved, is that a desperately poor blind beggar can be saved. 
a man who had nothing to give other than uh, giving up his life of begging, he can be saved. This man could see well enough that Jesus was worth following, even though his eyes didn't work at all. The rich guy could see perfectly well, but he was blinded by his great wealth. There's a truth that's revealed to us here, and I want you to chew on it this morning. That is that those who see things most clearly are very often not those who are most visible in our society. I want to repeat that. Those who see things most clearly are very often not those who are most visible in our society. The rich young ruler, think about him. I bet everybody knew him in the area. He was wealthy. He was young. He, he had power in the world. He was a ruler. Everybody knew him. But Bartimaeus, no one knew him. He was the kind of person that people ignored, walked past. He was the one you pass by on the other side from, you see, when you come across him. And, and when he spoke up on this occasion, when he shouted out to Jesus as Jesus passed by, notice that people tried to shush him up. But he could see. Yes, he could see. Jesus passing by in a large group. Apparently, they're on their way up to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus, of course, has another motive. He's on his way to the cross. And Jesus, like a rabbi, he's likely doing what most rabbis did. That is, he's teaching. He's speaking to the crowd as he walks. We tend to stop and stand. Uh, rabbis often walked and spoke. That's likely what's going on here, speaking as he went. And so when the blind man shouted for him, as Luke records, it was considered an interruption of a teaching session. And so they try in vain to hush him up. To silence him, but he just shouts all the more, all the louder, Jesus, have mercy. And notice who stopped the Lord. Isn't it amazing that the greatest teacher who ever lived can be interrupted? You know, sometimes I think I just can't be interrupted. Whatever I'm doing is just too important. I can't be interrupted. What I'm doing is, is so urgent, but Jesus, Jesus can be interrupted. Did you know that? You can bother Jesus even when he's teaching and he'll stop and pay attention to you. To Jesus, it was more important to do than to say. More important to act than to talk. Don't you love that about the Lord? Amen. Bartimaeus goes from begging for a few coins, which no doubt he did every day, to asking for the biggest prize he possibly could to recover his sight. And Jesus restores it. In fact, Bartimaeus gets an even bigger prize. 
He, he gets a relationship with Jesus. He goes with Jesus, the text says, follows him on to Jerusalem. And Jesus says to him, your faith has saved you. So, in fact, this, this outsider, this outcast, who's being rebuked by all the front runners, verse 39, being told by all those out front to be quiet, he steps out in bold faith and he's rewarded. He goes from being a, a, a street side beggar to traveling down the road with Jesus, the Son of God. And we learn once again that sometimes those who have nothing see a lot better than those who have much. Well, my friend this morning, the truth is that Jesus remains on the move. We've been following him since he set his face toward Jerusalem in Luke chapter 9. And Jesus, in a sense, remains on the move. He's still collecting followers. He's still gathering disciples, calling people to come and follow him. We're asking you this morning, do you see? Do you see this? The truth is, the most important sight organ of the body is the heart. The rich man's heart turned away from the Lord in blindness. The blind man's heart turned toward Jesus and his eyes were opened. Who can be saved? Those who turn to Jesus. Those who answer his call. And follow him. Those who obey from the heart his teaching. Who cry out to him for mercy. And forgiveness. Who can be saved? Those who turn to him for salvation. So today. The Lord's invitation is extended. To any here that are ready to answer his call, who are ready to follow, who are ready to say no to the world, yes to him. And we hope that you are ready today to obey the gospel of Christ, to repent, to change direction, to be baptized into Christ and to walk with him, Scripture says, in newness of life. That is his invitation to all who will see. And if you're in need of doing that today, we invite you to come and do it. Today is the day of salvation. And if you've been on the road with him but fallen away, Today is the day to come back. He is eager for your return. Can we help you in some way in your relationship with him? Can we pray with you? Can we baptize you? Can we help one another get to heaven? If you need to make a public response, the invitation is yours this morning as we stand and as we sing.